Okay, cycle between the, the organics and the carbons, the air, the water, and back to water again. Our concern is raised very, very stringently that we are actually creating water out of what was once a tree many eon, eon, millennia ago. Okay, we know that as our fossil fuels, fossils. It is the fossil of living things that we are burning and using, which, as I say, came from water. The thing about that is to consider is like a balloon. My grandfather talked about the time of great shaking that was coming. And I said, how do you know this? He had me get a balloon out of my room and we blew it up. And then if for people of a certain era or age, you remember that chalky water-based paint we had as children. We paint the balloon, many coatings of this. Then he had me take a needle and carefully put a small hole through the knot where you tie off the balloon so that it wouldn't break the balloon but we could let the air out slowly. Now what do you think happened to that chalky coating as the balloon shrank? Of course it cracked, it, it took on the appearance of like a little miniature earth with the subduction lines and the spider webbing of cracks all around it as that chalky surface was forced and stressed and pushed. Mm. Now we know that the earth possibly has expanded quite a bit from its central core. Through these processes of burying uh, uh, materials, continental drift over the top of that, we know our offshore areas where we get most of our oils from, Gulf of Mexico, uh, up in Alaska, uh, Santa Barbara Channel, etc. So there is something to be said for this theory that my grandfather said of the shrinking earth or deflating earth, cracking the surface and causing great tension, the time of great shaking, which is a Sami uh, prophecy goes way, way back. Uh, we're saying, I think, 18,000 years, they're talking about this this time. Um, anyway, when you think about it, what my grandfather was talking about was this cycle of from water to organics and then back again. When it goes back to water, when we burn uh, hydrates or, or fuels, we actually create eight, gallon, or eight barrels for every barrel we pull out. With natural gas, eight, one pound equals eight pounds of water as a yield. Because the oxygen, the big guy, 16 times bigger than the hydrogen, comes out of the uh, air. That plane flying flies because it's flying through oxygen. We know this. A candle is has no oxygen, it goes out. With no oxygen, that plane wouldn't fly. So this interdependency is very profound, it's very deep. But what happens is you're taking it, the, the, we, we are, we're taking carbons out from underneath the soil, which of course, you're deflating the balloon. Just think of the earth as my grandfather said, that little balloon. As it cracks, we start seeing these tsunamis and the, 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 the horrible earthquake there in Japan uh, took out that nuclear power plant, which was totally safe, but it wasn't safe from a tsunami. Uh, so these things are coming to be because we are letting out this pressure from under the earth, but it's compounded because we also are making eight barrels for every barrel we pull out and that is pressing down on it. Whether it be in the atmosphere, it's still pushing down on the earth. So it's a two-fold process. Hmm. And it's something all of our scientists should take into consideration. What are we doing in the greater, uh, not only global warming, which they're finally, uh, the people who shot down the concept of global climate change as just being natural, but accelerated by man, there, there is a refining of that argument that's coming to be. No longer can people just say, no, we don't have anything to do with it. Baloney, we don't. I'm telling you, we're taking you know, 265 uh, million years and compressing it into 150 to 200 to maybe, and they say, oh, petroleums can last up to 500 years. Oh, really? What then? That was my thinking when I was a kid. Okay, we got petroleum now, but what then? We have petroleum that's polluting the air. Is there a better way? So, you know, like I say, we're back to high school and making my little project there making steel. We're still thinking 
coughing in the air, you know, my lungs were bothered by the air. What, what to do about that? Is there, is there something else we can do? But this shrinking, pressurizing force that is happening is something we should think about. Sea level rise, there's a curious thing I want you to think about sea level rise. They say, oh, in Seattle, uh, it, it, we, there are docks that were built 700 years ago or 200 years ago. But Seattle is north on the planet. When something spins, its um, increase goes out at its waist. <laughs> I'm an example of that. Mother Earth is the same way. So this change in sea level rise is most dramatic at the equator, not up at the poles, not up at higher, uh, more northern or, or more southern latitudes. But you go into the central Pacific around the equator, and there are islands that are underwater by three feet. Come that on. they know. And then the answer to that from the opposition is, oh, well, that's because the Earth is sinking. Hello, I agree with you. The Earth is sinking because we're sucking the stuff out from underneath it. Mm. We've got to look at that and say all of these things. Bring them into play. How much is settling happening? You, you people in the coal industry areas of Appalachia, you know about mine subsidence. Whole towns just get sucked into the ground when the miners haven't left the right column structure in place. That's why they're tearing the rooftops off mountains now. It's just easier and they have none of that to suffer with. But who reclaims the land and makes it back like it was made originally? Who can say what, what natural should look like? Oh, they say we make a beautiful park. That's great. It's a man-made park. I think that's wonderful. But mine subsidence is only one example of how extraction of these minerals and materials from under the ground turn around to cause problems later on. An entire town went into the ground. <laughs> We're doing the same thing with petroleum. Now here's an interesting thing. You put salt water back in there, it breaks more oil loose from the deposit. So I don't, I'm not anti-petroleum uh, as such specifically. I think we need it as a transition fuel to get us to better things that are coming. But I will tell you the petroleum industry something. When you put the salt water back in there to replace the oil you're taking out, that salt water goes into all those tiny places and brings more oil out. So you will make more profit by trying also to think about the longest, the, the great cycle of things, the air, how it all interworks. Set and contemplate these things. Take the time to just say, what is water? What is air? What is energy? Oh, well, they got it all figured out. They don't have it all figured out. I don't have it all figured out. But I'm, I'm showing a little bit of, of the next step into the next way where we deal with energy using, as I call it before, water, the energy sponge. Hmm. Okay?